Let's start with a quick story. A data engineer walks into their home office to start the workday. They need to build a data pipeline on a small to medium sized data set. They choose Apache Spark in order to process the data concurrently, in other words, to run in parallel as much as possible. This may make the data load quicker when run on a single machine, but even better, it allows for speeding up the job by adding more nodes to a cluster if needed. And suddenly, they encounter a need to process a list of 10 or more tables, and the easiest solution now is to set up a loop that calls the same function once per table. So the clever data engineer writes this code in a notebook. Maybe it's Azure Databricks, maybe it's Azure Synapse, or even in a Jupyter notebook. When they run the code, they see that each table is processed concurrently, but it's only processing one table at a time sequentially. So how can we fix this? I'm going to show you a way to do concurrent processing in Python that'll work for a Spark notebook or in most Python environments. Check out the link for the written tutorial in the description where we'll have the code samples that I use. Let's dive in. So here we are in a Databricks notebook and we start with uh, a cluster that's already running, a session that's already going. This first cell is basically getting some things from a Databricks secret scope. In my case, it's a key vault back secret scope, but basically I'm not storing my password and username in clear text. And uh, it's also getting the host name for the database to use as well as uh, the database name. And so it just sets that up, nothing too crazy there. And then we come down and we think about our use case. We have a list of tables. In this case, it's I think every table in the Stack Overflow data set I have. It's not the largest, biggest Stack Overflow data set I could have, but it's still got a few gigs of data in some of these tables. And then we're going to have a call that's going to create that database if it doesn't exist yet. Uh, after that, we go ahead and build this load table function, which is really the core of what we're doing. Just for us to see what's going on, we have a print statement happen, uh, just to make it obvious in this notebook what table we're running for. And then we set up a destination table just to give it a database name uh, when it goes to Spark. So then the actual Spark work that's happening is from line eight to 15 here. And so what we're doing is saying, go ahead and read in with the SQL Server JDBC Spark driver. So I do recommend finding this driver and you do have to install it on the, the cluster, but it's gonna be quicker if you're actually reading from SQL Server. Even if you're reading from a different source, this concept of running and running concurrently still applies though. But if you're using SQL Server, this is the better driver to have. In Databricks, you have to install it. In Azure Synapse Spark, it's already installed for you. You'll set up this information. Go ahead and see the uh, the post that I've done with uh, more examples of what these values look like if it's not clear to you. And then once we've done the read and set up load, which says go ahead and pull this in as a data frame, we can run data frame dot write format as parquet. It's just a common file type if you're new to it. Uh, overwrite the table each time. So we're doing a full reload of each table in this case, and then we're gonna save it as whatever we called the table name. So that's what's happening on the Spark side. And we wanna basically just run the same type of code for every table in the uh, list above. So coming a little further, if we test that out right here for a very small table link types, it's going to print it and it's going to run a Spark statement for us. So by looking here, I can tell, okay, it ran one Spark, uh, one Spark stage. It only had one task in that stage. So pretty small, pretty easy because it's a small table. All right, now what I wanna do is show the results of if I were to do this one at a time. If I do this one at a time, it takes six minutes. And hopefully we can see this. You may just have to take my word on it. As it's running, each of these steps shows up one after the other. Let me do a quick run of this and I'll fast forward through so you can kind of see how it builds up one at a time. They don't all show up, you know, two, three, four at a time and run concurrently like we really want to happen on Spark. The print statement also shows us what's going on. It prints a table name as it's about to run it. And so we have to sit here and wait for it to process one table before it starts to work on the next and prints the table name. Okay, so now it gets to the post table and it's gonna take a little bit of time here, but you get the idea. It's doing it one at a time. In the end, it's gonna end up taking about six minutes here. Uh, let's take a look at what we're going to do next. Next, what we're going to do is uh, use two Python libraries, threading and queue in order to run concurrently. And this can work outside of notebooks, right? But it's a, it's a nice thing to do with Spark notebooks, which is why I'm showing it uh, in this context. So I can set up a queue and I'm just gonna put each item I care about, in this case, a table name into that queue. 
I can run, you know, as many in parallel as I try. I can I can put this as the worker count. So I'm gonna try and have two different parallel threads going. So basically I'm trying to load two tables at a time. Uh, and if one of them takes a while, the other thread should keep going on its tables. So then I can set up a wrapper function called run task, which is basically going to take whatever function I care to run. In this case, it's that load tables function from above. And then it's gonna take in the full queue. It's gonna take in that queue object and pull one off and, and, and work with it. So while the queue's not empty, we haven't already processed everything in the queue, it'll go ahead and uh, get the value from the queue, which will be the table name. It'll call the function that I passed in with that value and that table name. So it's gonna call load table with the table name in this case. And then when it's done with that, it calls task done for that item in the queue. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and print the table list just so that right before this runs, we can see all of them. And you can see the output from below if you like. Uh, and then this piece here is gonna loop through the table list and build up my queue. So this is really quick, just loop through, add them to the queue, don't do any processing yet. Down here is where I start to, to get into getting things running and, and uh, set up to run concurrently. And so uh, I'm gonna spin up an instance per worker count. In this case, it's two. I'm going to set my, um, set a variable T to a thread, give it a function that I want it to run. It's that wrapper function run task. So yours will look pretty similar. Even if you change up the naming, yours will look pretty similar, but you might want to switch out kind of the value and function piece if you prefer to do it a different way. Then whatever parameters my run task takes get passed in here. So that queue gets passed in over and over again, and my function name load table gets passed in. Now I can, um, go ahead and set the daemon to true and kick off start. And that's gonna get stuff going. Q.join will run and wait for it all to complete before it ends the notebook session. And so when that runs, we see it process and you'll see it print more than one table at a time at, at, at some times when it's running in parallel. And let's go ahead and clear out our database and then we can make that happen. Okay, so if I go back and look at my databases, it should be gone now. Yep, no more Stack Overflow database. All right, so I need to go back and run uh, this command that sets it all up and creates the database. Start with that. Okay, I don't need to rerun all of this for, for loop with, uh, without the concurrency. We'll run this concurrency cell now. So remember, it's going to start by printing the tables and this is the list. It's not super long, but it's still nice to have it processed multiple at a time. So see how it just keeps putting up, you know, table after table. It's not doing one, then one, then one like it had before. Now it's stuck running a couple at the same time. Post is the biggest one I had. It took like four minutes the first time. And so it's gonna be working on the post one for a bit, but after it finishes whatever else it's working on, I think it might still be working on comments. It's going to kick in and we'll see it happen pretty quickly again as it, it keeps the thread moving. There we go, post types, users, and so on. And so it's going to run a lot faster. It's going to be uh, making use of more of that cluster computing power I have. Of course, if there's other jobs running on the cluster, you'll need to be aware of that, right? But uh, I'm not sitting here single threaded from my Spark notebook, not getting full value out of uh, the compute resources I have. So that's the trick. That's the thing that I really think is cool. Let's take a quick look at the fact that this can work uh, pretty much the same code in. Um, Azure Synapse. So here I am in an Azure Synapse notebook and it's really the same code with just a few minor changes. Let me point those out for you. Uh, in the DB user and DB password, I need to use the, the way of managing secrets that you use with Synapse. And so what I've got is I've set up a link service key vault. You can watch my Synapse overview videos if you're not sure what I'm talking about here. I have a, a key vault that is set up as a link service and I can use MS Spark Utils instead of in Databricks, we had this DB Utils library. MS Spark Utils is what we use in Synapse. Uh, my key vault uh, link service is named demo KV, and so you would replace that with whatever you've named yours. And then this is my actual secret name, SQL User Stack Overflow. So you could change this to whatever you're using for your secret name. In addition, you have the option, I really tell you not to do this unless it's a very one-off situation with a temporary user account, is I could go ahead and just put in my uh, username and password in clear text here instead. And this is something I really discourage you from doing, but if you're just trying to get going and you know there's no real data, 
in the database, you might be able to set this up just to test it out and make sure you have everything else right. I really encourage you to go switch the password if you do this even just for a little bit. So as a quick reminder, what we have next, it's I think I switched up the order just a little bit, but we have the create database statement. And the location here is where you'll wanna think about what location you want. This is going to just use the default container that's that's linked within Azure Synapse and create a, a new path called demo and stack overflow underneath there. We also have the list of tables again. I kept the same table list, so nothing's really different. Load tables, the same function as we had in Databricks. So let's skip down to our core code, and it really is identical to what we had in Databricks with a couple differences in print statements to try and get a little bit better view of the start and finish. And let's go ahead and skip forward and watch this run. We'll see it print things out the same way it did in Databricks, where instead of doing it one at a time and there's this lag for any big tables like we saw when we had it sequential, we'll see one to two tables get printed at a time and it'll have like a little burst of printing tables and eventually it'll hit the post table and slow down a little bit while it, while it processes the biggest table and kind of finishes up the last couple of things. So here Synapse has processed everything and it did it in a very similar way to Azure Databricks. So in this case, it ran a little bit longer than sometimes. I'm not sure what happened trying to load that last table, but that's okay. It did complete. If I scheduled this, I have confidence that it would continue to work well, and uh, every once in a while I'll see an error in the notebook uh, related to Jackson bind. And that's something that I think is just a notebook thing. Usually if I stop my session, get a fresh session, then I'm in good shape for this. So if you're going to schedule a parallel load of databases, this is how you would do it with Azure Synapse and how you would do it with Azure Databricks is what we looked at prior to this. There we go, we've done it. We've run things concurrently from a single notebook while keeping that for loop that was so easy to write and understand. Uh, I do know there's a little bit of extra stuff going on. So hopefully reading through the code and watching this again, if you need to, we'll, we'll get you up to speed and you can try this in your own environment and just keep an eye on you know that worker count, how many workers is right for you, uh, how many executors are you uh, assigning with each notebook run. Um, but that should help you to avoid that bottleneck of running things in a loop and therefore not taking advantage of the Spark cluster or pool that you're working with. If you wanna hear more data engineering content from me, Please subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time.